The text this morning is from Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 16. These are the words of God. When Herod, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Then in verse 7, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Let's pray together. Our Father... God, we know that we like to measure ourselves by ourselves, and we pray that your spirit would protect us from this great folly. Help us to see, really see, what the lordship of Jesus Christ really means. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. amen. The carnal and unbelieving mind always understands political rule in a particular kind of way. The names may change. Pharaoh, Caesar, Pope, President for Life, whatever. But the underlying realities are always the same. These realities have to do with tyranny and coercion, raw power, the imposition of a right-handed kind of power, do what I say or else, the kind of power that is necessarily suspicious of biblical liberty. This is a carnal political power that breaks the two great commandments, the commandment to love God and to love your neighbor. It does, not re it does not love God because the state wants to be God, and it refuses to love its neighbor. This is what denial of human rights always amounts to, a refusal to love the individual, a refusal to love your neighbor. Jesus taught us that the children of this age are often more shrewd than the children of light are. They are often more aware of the ramifications of what we say we believe than we are aware of it. We will say that we believe something, and what we say we believe poses a threat to them, and they see the threat, and we do not see the threat. When Herod heard of a king of the Jews, and of a star in the east, and of the wise men's intent, to come and worship this king, he was troubled, it says in verse 3. Not only was he troubled, but it says all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. And given his position and given his disposition, this was an entirely predictable and natural response. Given the rules of the game that he was playing, it was understandable that he reacted this way. He was not imagining things. Second, Herod took the news that the Magi brought seriously. It says that he investigated their timeline, verse 7, and he did so diligently. He was very careful to calculate what they were talking about. The birth of Jesus was a threat to him and to his kind of rule, and he knew it very well. The seriousness with which he took these omens can be measured by what he was willing to do about it which was to have the young boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas slain, verse 16. This was not just an idle thing that troubled Herod in passing. He thought about it, he meditated on it, and he was willing to murder in terms of it. He took it very seriously. So we can see that from the very beginning, the life of Jesus presented a very potent threat to the status quo. This threat was not the result of Herod's paranoia. Herod knew what many Christians do not know. The birth of this child was intended to mean that the old way of ruling mankind was doomed. Let me say that again. The old way of ruling mankind was doomed. The transition from the old way of rule to the new way of rule was not going to be simple or easy, but it was going to happen. We can see that the transition has been some 2,000 years in the making so far. There's still many there are still many advocates of the old way of rule among us, but God be praised, God's kingdom is advancing. Of the increase of the Lord's government, it says, there would be no end, the prophet Isaiah tells us. But whatever it meant, Herod knew that he was 
against it. But we have some workarounds that we've come up with. There are all kinds of workarounds that we have developed, workarounds that, in, that enable timid Christians to rush in to assuage Herod's fears. We tell, we tell him, there's no need to panic. There's no need to kill anybody. No need to do that at all. You see, Christ brings a spiritual kingdom that never, ever touches down. You're, you're quite mistaken in, in thinking that the rule of Jesus is a threat to your kind of rule. Well, that's a problem. When we try to allay Herod's fears by telling him, in effect, that Christ's kingdom is an ethereal, spiritual, floaty kind of thing, that where Jesus is king in our hearts, or Jesus is king between our ears and behind our eyes, that Jesus is king uh, somewhere else, anywhere else than what you lay claim to, what you lay claim to, the problem is we are assuaging his fears by bearing false witness. The rule that Jesus brings does present a threat to that kind of rule. It does present a threat to the Pharaohs, the Caesars, and the Herods. Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. But our political sins are not exempted from this salvation. Why would our political sins, which frequently have been among our foulest sins, be excluded? Why would Jesus come down to deal with all our sins except the really big ones? Jesus Christ came into this world as the savior of our race. If our race was beset with 17 different kinds of terminal disease, why would Jesus come down to heal only two of them? Why would Jesus come down to be a partial savior? Why would he leave the very worst of them untouched? A partial savior is no savior at all. A doctor who, who heals two out of 17 terminal diseases is not doing you any favors. Too many Christians need to, remind, need to be reminded to not rob Christ of the greatness of his offered salvation. We can see from Matthew's account, we can see from the rest of the Gospels, that Jesus lived a book-ended life. His life was noticed by the political authorities at the beginning of it and at the end of it. When Jesus was born into this world, the attention of the existing rulers was drawn to that fact. God made sure that they understood that the king had arrived. The political leaders of that day were told about it. A star appeared in the sky, and respected wise men came on a long journey, and they brought their news straight to court. They arrived in Jerusalem, and there, where's the king? We, we saw a star. We came to worship the king. Where is this king so that we may worship him? And all of Jerusalem was troubled. It was in the newspapers, and the news came straight to Herod's court. The wise men got an audience with Herod. The wise men came to Israel, and they got an audience with one kind of king, and then they got an audience with another kind of king. They got an audience with the kind who would murder to keep his throne, and then they got an audience with the one who came into this world to die to gain his throne. One who was willing to kill, one who was willing to die. So when Jesus was condemned to die, at the end of his life, he was condemned by the Roman governor at the insistence of a mob stirred up by the national parliament of the Jews. The life of Jesus, from beginning to end, was a public life. He was born in poverty. We know that Mary and Joseph were poor because of the sacrifice they offered up at the temple for Jesus. It was the sacrifice of turtle doves, which was the sacrifice that poor people would offer. He was born in poverty, but he was not born in obscurity. Given the physical circumstances, it would have been an obscure birth if the God of heaven had not made a point of sending wise men to tell the king all about it. It would have been obscure, known only to the angels in heaven and to the shepherds who didn't have an audience at the court and to the sheep. It would have been an obscure birth, except for the wise men who came to Jerusalem talking about it. God made a point of leaving the rulers of this age without excuse. A different kind of king has come, and we see that at the beginning of his life, and we see that at the end of his life. 
Now, we have said many times that Jesus came into this world to show us a new way of being human, to model for us a new way of being human, and by his death and resurrection, to provide the, the foundation stone for a new way of being human. But this is not a lesson that we must learn down in our hearts and nowhere else. This is not a lesson that we can privatize. A new way of being human involves everything that it means to be human, and humans are private and public both. No, humanity is what it is down in the recesses of our hearts, and it is what it is in the public square. It is not possible to be simply a private human being. That's not a human being at all. It is not possible to be simply a public human being and not have private thoughts and not have a private mind and a private heart. That's not being human. Human beings are private and public both. And Jesus came into this world to show us a new way of being human. Mankind is what it is, both within and without. It is what it is inside and outside. Human, humanity is what it is in the home and in business. It is uh, is, it is what it is at home and out in the town. If it is true that Jesus was born into this world to show us a new way of being human, this must necessarily include what we do in every place in which we find ourselves. Everywhere we go, Jesus is showing us a new way of being human in that place. Everywhere we go. This includes when we are alone, of course. It includes when we are in bed. It includes when we're at the dinner table with our families. It includes when we are out in the town and so forth. Of course, it, it includes every aspect of our lives. But it also includes every aspect of everyone's life. The claims of Jesus Christ are total. It did not just include every aspect of the shepherd's lives or every aspect of the wise men's lives or every aspect of Mary and Joseph's lives, although it did. It also included every aspect of Herod's life, and that's what he didn't want. That's what he rejected. He said, I don't want it to include every aspect of my life. So it includes this claim, the total claims of Jesus Christ, on everyone's life go from the lowest hired hand up to the CEO of the corporation, from the most obscure citizen up to the greatest political dignitaries. What the angels said, peace on earth, goodwill to men, applied to the shepherds and it applied to Herod. It applied to Caesar and it applied to the wise men. It applied to everyone in the story. Some accepted that it applied to them and others rejected that it applied to them. God wants all to be saved and he wants all to come to a knowledge of the truth from the king on down. The transformation that Jesus has inaugurated is no partial thing. And so, your celebrations at Christmas time are all to be conducted in the name of Jesus, of course. But there's more to it. He is the reason for the season, but more than this, he is the Lord of the season. And he's the Lord of the season because he's the Lord of the earth. He did not come down here. He was not born on this earth in order to work out a power-sharing arrangement with Caesar. He didn't come to say, I'll tell you what, Herod, why don't you take that part and I'll take this part? Why don't you take this, this portion, Caesar, and I'll take this portion? Why don't you rule them physically and I'll rule them spiritually? Why don't you govern their bodies and, and behaviors and economic trans transactions and I'll govern their hearts? Jesus, most emphatically, did not come to do that. And those Christians who claim that that's what he came to do are bearing false witness. I just uh, had the privilege of watching a documentary uh, called The Singing Revolution, and it's a documentary of how Estonia, one of the Baltic states, won its independence from the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union was coming unstuck, when everything was falling apart, there were different ways of challenging the communists. But in Estonia, they had a singing revolution. It's quite a striking um, story. And one of the things that struck me about this was not just the, the music, uh, the potency of music in uh, defying tyranny, but the potency of Christmas. One of the one of the individuals interviewed talked about how when he was growing up, they had to they put up a Christmas tree in their home. But when they put up a Christmas tree in their home, they had to keep the curtains drawn. They had to not let anybody know that there was a Christmas tree in their home. Why? Because Herod doesn't like it. 
right? Herods don't like that sort of thing. Herods feel threatened by that sort of thing, but they only feel threatened by it if we are observing it the way we ought to observe it. If we observe Christmas, if we allow Christmas to be co-opted by Herod and let Herod turn it into something that poses no threat to him, he's happy enough with it. He's happy enough with winter festivals. He's happy enough with happy holidays. He's happy enough with let's celebrate the fact that it's cold. He's happy with any kind of celebration other than a celebration of the fact that a different kind of king has come into the world, and this kind of king who's come into the world is now the model for every king, for every ruler. Every king must acknowledge that this is what a king is like. This is how rule is conducted. This is what you do. You die for your people. You do not kill your people. You sacrifice for your people. You do not make your people sacrifice for you. Let your Christmas celebrations be joyful, therefore. Your Christmas celebrations ought to be joyful. They ought to be merry. But in order for it to be the right kind of joy, those celebrations should be one of the most political things that you do. Far more potent than voting, far more potent than writing your congressman, far more potent than agitating for something or lobbying for something else celebrating the birth of a different kind of king whose rule you intend to take seriously in your private life and in your public expression of your private life. That kind of Christmas is the kind of Christmas that makes Herod's nervous. It should be the sort of thing that carnal kings worry about. Carnal kings ought to worry about Christmas. Carnal kings ought to see it as a threat. And the fact, this is one thing that we can take encouragement from, the fact that our secularists are waging a war against Christmas and trying to get all expressions of Christ and all expressions of his birth and his rule out of public discussion or public display should be a heartening thing. There's something, there's something there that is still a threat to them. But we don't want to take too much comfort from it. You recall that when Lot was trying to keep the... Uh, the inhabitants of Sodom from taking the angels that he had shown hospitality to. He was trying to prevent them from taking them off, and Lot offered his own daughters instead of the guests that he was showing hospitality to. This was hardly Lot's shining hour. This, this was hardly him being a great martyr for the truth. But even that dim glimmer of the, the Sodomites' response to him, you're a stranger, you just came to take residence, and already you're judging us? Doesn't the Bible say, the Sodomites said to Lot, doesn't the Bible say, judge not lest you be judged? How dare you judge us, you a stranger coming in? And you're trying to hint, uh, we, we picked it up, you're trying to hint that there was something wrong with our behavior, this mob outside your house demanding that we be allowed to rape your guests. How dare you judge us? Now, that was hardly Lot's shining hour, but Lot's righteousness was there. The New Testament tells us that Lot was a righteous man. He was dismayed by what's going on. Lot was a righteous man, but he was not a courageous man. He understood what they were doing was evil, but he didn't understand the full ramifications of what God had called him to do. In the same way, many Christians are righteous in their memory, their, rec their commemoration, their remembrance of the birth of a new kind of king. The problem is we're not being ruled by that new kind of king the way we ought to be ruled by him. And if we accept his rule over our lives, over our families, over our congregation, over our people, if we accept him as the model king, this is going to have implications for what we do politically. You might say, well, you're, aren't, you, aren't you overstating it? No, I don't think, it, I don't think so at all. Herod... Herod killed all the boys two years old and under in the area of Bethlehem, which was a small town. Probably, when you're speaking of geopolitical realities, not a large number of boys. Still, it was murder. Here, there are differences between Herod and our rule. Herod wasn't elected. We, elected our, we, we elect our rulers. He was imposed on the Jews by the Roman Empire. He was imposed upon them and by force of arms. We vote these people in. We vote these people in because we do not think of Jesus as a model king. What we need to recognize is that Jesus was born into this world, and it, he was declared from the beginning to be a king. And kings rule. Kings rule a certain way. His followers follow that, model themselves after that. His followers accept what he's doing. Now, this does not mean that we should 
go out and start um, agitating for revolution. We honestly don't need to do that. All we need to do is accept that Jesus is a king in this world. Jesus is a king over our authorities. Jesus is a king over our way of doing business. Jesus is king over our way of being human. And his way of being human takes precedence over our way of being human. So celebrate Christmas, feast, give presents to one another, give, give, give gifts to one another, give yourself away. Why? Because that's what our king did. That's what the new kind of being a king, that, that, that's what a new kind of king does. That's how we are to live. That's how we're to model ourselves. That's what we're supposed to spread to other people. Jesus rules by dying. Herod rules by killing. Our Father, we thank you. We pray that your spirit would teach us how to celebrate Christmas in such a way that every rebellious ruler on earth would tremble and would tremble because they hear the sound of your name. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. For those who see the problems with the world, they see how grim it is, they see how unbelieving it is, they see how dark and disobedient it is in so many ways. The besetting sin of conservatives who look at the world that way is to become shrill, hard-bitten, nasty, uh, just upset in a way that sours them. And so when, I would, I, when I've been talking about uh, the conflict between Christ and Herod, by no means am I wanting us to go outside take the culture wars and all the grim and grit of, that, of th those wars and drag it into your Christmas celebrations. What I'm saying is it goes the other way. It goes the other way. Merry Christmas to all and take that Merry Christmas, learn to how, to be, how to become a merry warrior, learn how to engage in the conflict the way God calls us to engage in conflict. Unsheath Christmas, take the joy of Christmas and take it out there. The Bible tells us that the gospel is the stench of death to those who are unbelieving. And yet, the Bible calls it good news. It's good news. This is a Merry Christmas. This is a joyful gospel. And we need to take it out, not bring what they've got in. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always. And amen and Merry Christmas. <laughs>